Hey, I want to share a message. Uh, uh, my title is, It Ran in the Family Until It Ran Into You. Yeah. It ran in the family until it ran into you. I'll be reading our, our main text. It'll be Genesis chapter 35, and we'll turn there in a second. Let me share something humorous. Three men were on a great outdoors adventure. And they were walking through the wilderness, and they came across a roaring river. They had to cross the other side. The first man dropped to his knees and asked God to give him the strength to make it across that river. And poof, God gave him two huge biceps. He <laughs> dove into that river, and 45 minutes later, he had swum across that raging river. The second man dropped to his knees and said, God, give me the wisdom. Or, excuse me, give me the tools to make it across this river. And God gave him, poof, a rowboat. He got in the rowboat and rode across that river in just 30 minutes. The third man said, God, give me the wisdom. And poof, God turned him into a woman. <laughs> and he got out the map and saw that there was a bridge two minutes away and crossed over <laughs> on the bridge. Genesis chapter 35. The Bible tells us quite a bit about this particular biblical character, Jacob. And it, I'm, I'm encouraged that there are people at least as dysfunctional and possibly more dysfunctional than me in the Bible. Yeah, right. It builds my faith. Yeah. So thank you, God, for writing about Jacob. Yeah. Verse 9 of chapter 35 says, God appeared to Jacob again when he came to Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. That was the name his parents had given him. But your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. Jacob means deceiver or heel grabber, because he had grabbed his brother's heel. He was a twin son and came out second, but he was holding the heel of his older brother Esau. And, and, and Israel means prince with God, prince with God. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be truthful and multiply, and nation and accompany nations will proceed from you and kings shall come from your body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I'm giving to you and your descendants after you. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where God had talked to him, a pillar of stone. He poured drink offering on it. He poured oil on it. Jacob called the name of that place Bethel, house of God. They journeyed from Bethel. He is with his wife and a little entourage. And there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath when Rachel labored in childbirth. And she had hard labor. She's an older woman. She's having a miracle child. It came to pass while she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, Do not fear. You will have this son also. And so it was as her soul departed, for she died, that she called the name of her son Benoni. But his father called him Benjamin. Benona means son of my great sorrow. Benjamin means son of my right hand. Wow. Father, anoint your servant, your people, and your word, I pray. We've come, God, to have an encounter with you tonight. Thank you for this world-class church. Thank you for the miracle of what it is, the difference it's making, not just in this region, but around the world. Bless all the pastors that are up in the mountains, wherever they are, God. Let them have a great time together. Let strategy from heaven flow, God. Give them so much encouragement, inspiration, and renewal. Thank that they're going to come back on fire. And meet us here tonight, Lord. Touch every person in this room, those watching and listening. In the matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. I love this story for so many reasons, but tonight we're talking about someone who stopped something that was running in the family. When Jacob was born, his parents observed a initial behavior that was his his desire to be ahead in life to be a heel grabber and they actually named him a really you know critically negative name it'd be like calling someone a deceiver a con man and just a baby so they marked their baby by initial behavior that that was negative and so all of his life he kind of lived down to his name 
He stole his brother's birthright and blessing. He had to run for his life. He had an interesting journey for years and years. But now he's older. This is going to be his 12th son. And he's coming to a place where God's ready to change his life. And he, the Lord said to him, your name is Jacob. And Jacob, he said, yeah, that's who I am. And God says, well, that's changing today. And God declared over him that he was a prince. A prince, someone who had prevailed with God and man. He was a prince of God, a prince with God. And God gave him a new name. You know, that's what the Bible does. The Bible is a book of identity, not behavior. The Bible tells us who we are in Christ. If any man or woman is in Christ Jesus, the Bible says they are a new creation. Old things passed away. All things become new. That's what God's given us. And so in Christ, we are the forgiven, the redeemed, the accepted, the blessed, the anointed, the called, the chosen. You're a history maker and a world shaker. And no matter where we come from, what our family origin or our own historical path has been, when we come to Jesus, we get a new DNA. We get a heavenly impartation of identity. And so identity is so significant that when you ask God to show you your destiny, he'll tell you your identity because identity unlocks destiny. God always tells the who before the what in our journey. And so it's so important because the way you see yourself determines the way you see everything else. It's impossible to see life right when you see yourself wrong. So the Bible keeps pouring into us the imagery of who we are. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are the children of God, the beloved children of God. And so the Lord visits him, and God's introduced to Jacob, just like he had to his father Isaac and to his father Abraham, this great name called El Shaddai. And El Shaddai was this powerful name that God used whenever it was time for a breakthrough in one of the patriarchs' life. It was the fulfillment of destiny name. It was the miracle name. El Shaddai, when God said, I am God Almighty. El Shaddai means so many great things, but it was the name by which the patriarchs knew God. It means to be mighty, to be unconquerable. It indicates God's greatness, his strength, his everlasting nature. He's the all-sufficient God, yep. eternally capable of being all that his people need. So he's, he's the God that's more than enough. Right. And God says to him, I got this. God says, if I call you something, you're that because my name is so powerful. My nature is so powerful. My virtues and my ability is so powerful that when I call something and name it and declare my power over it, it changes to become that. And God says, it's time for you to change. And so Jacob finally got it. He said, you know what? I'm going to stop answering to the wrong name. I'm going to stop answering to shame to condemnation, to failure, to dishonesty. I'm going to start answering to my real name. I'm a prince with God. Come on, all all the young people, where are the young people at? All the princes and princesses up here in the section. And so God's dealing with him, and he needed a breakthrough. And, And the breakthrough was to see himself and to break the curse. His parents loved him. His parents didn't want to curse him, but his mother, his mother, by the way, Rachel, is in the Hall of Fame. She's a famous biblical character, but she has a very painful moment, and the moment is so intense, her pain overtakes her rationality, her reason, her prophetic guidance, her godliness, and so out of her pain, she curses the very son she had believed God for by a miracle. Rachel was very good and godly, but she experienced so much pain, it blinded her concerning the prophetic destiny of the son that she was giving birth to. Instead of calling heel grabber, she should should, should have called him a name. Here's the conqueror. Here's the guy that's going to rise in life. Good people can unleash bad things into their families when they don't deal with their own pain. So she's a godly woman. But she's in so much pain, she transfers her pain to her son. Wow. She transfers her pain to her son. With the Bible, we call this a generational curse. And a generational curse is when an issue in a family is passed down 
generation to generation. It comes from Exodus chapter 20, and it's referred to it a few times in the Bible. And it, 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 Exodus 20 says that the sins of the father will pass down to the third and fourth generations of their sons and daughters. So that there is an impartation negatively. That verse also says that the righteous person will have a thousand generations of blessing. <laughs> kind of tipping the scales. But the idea is, that, and as a, as a psychologist, I see this all the time, that, that patterns are repeated in families. That they're repeated without conscious effort, without having to, you know, go to the school of how you learning to do something bad. Behaviors are learned and they're imparted intuitively through the through the genes to a spiritual atmosphere in families. And so, so he's born, this baby's born, and his name means son of sorrow. Basically, his name means the baby who killed his mother. The baby, and so here's here's Jacob, who's now Israel, who had just a few days before had a God encounter where he broke a curse over his life. Wow. He's walking around holding Benoni, son of sorrow, and he starts shaking his head. Can you imagine the upheaval, both the the, the frantic pain and the great joy, the the the, the contradiction of having. The, the miracle baby and losing the love of his life. He and his wife had a great love affair. They really loved each other. And so that when the nurse opened the door and said, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is, here's your 12th son. The bad news is the love of your life died giving you this child. And Jacob's holding the, the, the baby with the name son of sorrow. And he starts having a dialogue with himself. He says, nope. This thing ends today. This thing ends today. I'm not going to allow my precious wife, who was overwhelmed by grief and pain, I'm not going to allow her, her pain to pass into this baby's life, disadvantaging him from the beginning. And he said, in fact, I'm going to name him the very opposite of that name. He's going to be my closest son, Benjamin, son of my right hand. He broke the curse over his son because he had broke the curse over his life. Wow. Recognize in your life and family where good people have unleashed bad things by their words and behavior. It's so important because we want to be kingdom-minded to the place where we can love people that have hurt us and interpret their journey and understand that hurt people hurt people, but we want to be loved people that love people. We want to be blessed people that bless people, change people that change people, heal people that heal people. Just because it's lasted till now doesn't mean it's God's will for your life. Oh, Pastor, all the men in my family are players. Well, good for you guys. Why don't you be a godly man loyal to one woman? Come on. Why don't you break that curse? Well, in our family, this behavior is often people will justify and rationalize behavior by their, their, their origins or, their, or their, 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 their racial origins. Well, you know, we're all Italian. Oh, we're all, we're Hispanic, or we're, in my case, we're Swedish. I don't, Ikea and meatballs, that's about it. <laughs> and if we're not careful, we'll miss our breakthrough because we're defending it instead of defeating it. Wow. <clears throat> I love... I love when God shows me a man. There, there are so many godly men in this church. Listen, I, it's wonderful, all the godly ladies too, but I love a church filled with men. When I grew up in Pentecost, uh, you know, a few years ago as a little boy, the, the church was predominantly, I, I would say like two-thirds women, maybe even three-fourths. So when a man got saved, it was, oh, glory to God on high. A man has come to Christ. And, and look at this church filled with godly men. Come on. That's, that's a cool thing. There was almost a cultural thing in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Well, you know, that's, that religious stuff's for the gals. 
And here we are, men on fire, history makers and world shakers at Awaken Church. Some of you are living in the pain poured out on your life by someone else. Father, mother, sibling, spouse, etc. So, so often we, we face kind of an unseen foe. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's this, this conforming force, this, this impulse and this pressure. And, and it's not because we've done anything. It's because we've inherited something. But as believers, we have authority to break that, okay? Yes. A couple of points, and we're going to get into the good stuff. So in, in the book of Genesis, God creates the animals. He, he makes Adam, you know, fashions him, breathes life to him. And Adam and God uh, share a union of likeness. So Adam is in the image and likeness of God. And God creates the animals and prays them in front of Adam and says, Adam, I've made them, but I, I want you to name them. Yeah. And so God steps back, pushes his, his son Adam, and Adam stands there. He looks at the animals, and he sees this little chubby thing coming. He says, that's a hippopotamus. <laughs> and God says, that's right. That's what I would have called it. And Adam named things right because he was in union with God. Now, here's the cool part of that verse. And whatever Adam called them, God called them. God gave the naming rights to Adam. Now, now here's the thing about life. Whatever you call something, God honors it. Oh, I got a crappy marriage. God says, okay, crappy marriage. I got this. It, it works throughout the entirety of life. So, so I, I, um, in our church, God gave us a miracle church and, um, a few years ago, but it's older, like uh, 50, parts of it are 50 years old, parts of it are 60 years old. It just needs, so we're re- refurbishing. It's huge, uh, 200,000 square feet. And so but the parking lot had holes so deep, small cars would just disappear. <laughs> just like, where'd that VW bug go? It went down the hole. It's gone. And so I, I, I would call it the Grand Canyon. You know, so I'd come to work, ah, the Grand Canyon. And the Lord said something to me. He said, Michael, I can't bless this till you stop cursing it. Wow. Yeah, true. And, and I'd go, are you telling me the reason our parking lot's not repaid? Because I'm misnaming it. So I got out of my car and said, I bless this parking lot. It's beautiful. It's going to be repaved. It's going to glisten with asphalt and new lines. And so a lady, about two weeks later, a lady came to the office. She said, I can't stand the parking lot. Here's a check. Please fix it. <laughs> and uh, we have, we, we have a huge parking lot. So it was significant. So, so in my life, I try to watch places where my experience try to contaminate my vocabulary about something. I was coming, you know, we've been through an amazing journey. I'm grateful for, I'm so grateful for God's kindness and God's faithfulness in my life. And without God, I I simply wouldn't be here. Um, But... um, There was a time that I had, in one moment um, of time, I had 15 attorneys concurrently. And we were going through a tremendous battle. Our Trish treasurer had a bezel of $20 million. We were building a 5,000-seat building, a 4,800-seat building. All that fell apart. We're on the front page of the paper 10 times um, because of this, the business guy. So anyways, um, because of kind of the intensity of that moment, I became more and more negative. And so I'm, I, I drove my 14-year-old son to play basketball, um, to watch his basketball game in Maricopa. Where's Jack at Maricopa? And uh, um, he has some family there. And uh, um, little Matthew won the game at the buzzer. He was a great athlete. And, uh, but on the way there, after I, I spent four or five hours that day with attorneys, and just no good news was happening in our world. It wasn't their fault, but it just was what was happening. And so I said, I breathed out of my mouth in the front of that little Honda minivan. I said, I feel like I'm cursed. I said, I feel like I'm cursed. Everything is falling apart. And I'm talking to myself and having a pity party. 
So Matthew wins the game, and we've got this, you know, a Honda minivan with like 120,000 miles on it. It's a perfect family car because you could not do any more damage to it. <laughs> so I come out of the game, and there in that parking lot at Maricopa High School, and I come to the spot where my car used to be, and I, I'm sure I parked here. There's always a moment of denial. Hmm, I don't park here. I remember it because there was a Mercedes on one side and a Lexus on the other side. And I put my junk, my junk right between them just to show off, you know, to kind of, <laughs> kind of balance the scales there. And uh, I stood there and th disbelief, and, and then, you know, they had stolen it, you know, ruined it, took it for a joyride. So, so my car was stolen. So I'm, so I'm doubly feeling like I'm cursed. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, I'm definitely cursed. And... Uh, so I'm, I got my arms folded, I'm having a pity party, and the, and the Lord comes and he starts talking to me. And he says, Michael, would you like to know why your car is stolen? I said, yes, I would. <laughs> Please enlighten me. And he said this to me, it was the only cursed car in the parking lot. Wow. And then I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I made my mess worse. I contributed to a negative outcome. And the Lord began to show me. And, and, and so over time, our, our family went through a real uh, trial. We were homeless, and my oldest son started self-medicating, um, doing drugs. And we lived in Scottsdale. He had a lot of rich friends. They were supplying cocaine to him. That was his drug of choice. He's running the streets now. He moved out at 18. He's running the streets 18, 19, 20. And, and drug dealers want to kill him and, and police want to arrest him. And I just would lay on his bed and say, God, don't let my son die tonight. Just brokenhearted father. And it was like a seven-year journey with addiction. And uh, the Lord came and challenged me and said, I want you to change the way you would talk about your son. God says, all you do every day is tell me where he is. He said, God said this, I want you to start telling the devil where your son's going to be. I want you to start telling the devil where your son's going to be. And I, I ran in and told my wife, honey, God just told me I've been talking. We're going to talk. So I'd see Matthew. He was always respectful, even when he was away from God and high on drugs. I put my, Matthew, you're a history maker, a world shaker. You're going to be a great man of God. Said, yeah, Dad, sure. Yeah, you know. So I prayed for seven years. Nothing happened. I changed my vocabulary. And six weeks later, Matthew was uh, praying or uh, playing college basketball at a junior high before drug testing. And, uh, <laughs> no, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, so he's playing, he's playing there, and uh, he wanted to date one of the cheerleaders. So she said, she's a godly girl. She said, I'll only date you if you come to my church. So he had been to church for a few years. He goes to church. He's sitting in the back row. He's pouting, you know, look at his watch. When this thing's over. Yeah, yeah. So it's an inner city um, church. And the guy, I think he was an African-American, uh, a black pastor, and he, a guest pastor, he said, there's someone here who's running from God. Your heart's been broken, you're addicted, and tonight God's going to set you free. Oh. Sit in the back row, my son fell out of the pew and shook on the ground for 90 minutes. When he got up, he was set free from a cocaine addiction, oh. just like that. One night, one night, counted with God. Now, here's my point. When I broke some junk off of me in my home, it allowed God to break some junk off my son out there in the world. God just needs one person to break a curse, and he can set a whole family free. It ran into the family until it ran into you in, in, in Galatians chapter 3, this great verse that we all should really no, it says this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, yeah. having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is the person who hangs upon the tree. In order that the blessings of Abraham 
might come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus and that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. When I came to Christ, I got the authority to break free from every curse. I got curse-breaking authority. The strongest demonic power you you will ever face is not coming from Washington, D.C., although apparently a lot of demons have moved there. (laughs) It's not coming from some other, you know, the satanic church in town. The strongest demonic force you will ever face comes from your family. Because it's been legally embedded by the behaviors of past generations. But just one anointed child of God has a power to break those curses. You are the one, brothers and sisters. You are the one that will break and destroy every generational curse that has ever hurt, controlled, and oppressed your family. You are the curse breaker that is stopping the curses and unleashing the blessings of God on your family. Someone say, I'm a curse breaker. breaker. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a curse breaker. breaker. It is really true. That in the kingdom of God, God is helping us understand that we can change everything when we change. The Bible says, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. There are so many things that just by determined behavior, doing the opposite, do the opposite of what the devil's done. Do the opposite and watch curses break. Say things in accordance with God's purpose and God's plan and watch things come to an end. There's nothing God can't change to a changed person. And in your family, God just needs one. He just needs one person. Many of you have broke free from all kinds of historical difficulties and dysfunction and you're the curse breaker. God's so proud of you. And you're creating a whole new legacy, a whole new momentum for the generations that will come after you. You're changing the world. You're changing the outcomes of things. That's what we want to do. We want to be changed people that demonstrate by a lifestyle so attractive, so appealing, so Christ-like, so biblical, that people want what we have. Amen. Amen. We don't, listen, we don't just want to win arguments, we want to win hearts. And we win hearts by showing them our lives, by exhibiting a healed marriage, by exhibiting a a overcoming life. I so enjoyed what Miss Page shared about the breakthrough and promotion and her husband and their family, and what a great revelation. Thank you. It was great stuff. And it wasn't just biblical, a biblical Bible story. It was a testimony of the Bible working in their family. It was a curse-breaking testimony. No matter what limitations have been put upon you, you're breaking out of them. No matter who has labeled you something. Come on, I had a whole city label me something 25 years ago. If you're in the front page paper 10 times, People will call you names. And, and so I became clinically depressed, manically, suicidally for two and a half years until I broke my agreement with what was being said about me. And I, and I went back to kindergarten in the kingdom. And in kindergarten, you sit, you can imagine me in a little tiny kindergarten seat. And in kindergarten, Jesus comes to the class and he says, today's lesson is I love you. I love you no matter what. I love you big church, little church, no church. Amen. Amen. When my son was away from God, I never stopped loving him. I never stopped caring for him. My heart was broken for him. And I was telling Jack on the way here, one of the lies of the enemy is that the only way you can love someone is to affirm their lifestyle. But love never demands that you compromise your convictions. You can love someone and still hold to your beliefs. We want to carry the balance of those things in the stewardship of the kingdom. 
where, we, where people feel loved around us even when we speak the truth that, that can confront things in their story or their journey. God, thank you for helping us. Come on, just lift your hands to heaven. I, I just have a few minutes. So I'm going to pray for as many people as I can in this time. God, thank you for doing. It's a new season for you guys. It's a breakthrough season. The Lord's proud of you both. God's proud of how far you've come, sir. And I just want to declare over you, you're the curse breaker. You're the curse breaker that stopped death and disease and violence and pain. You're the curse breaker that's reversing the trends of what's happened. And God, these last three years have been so miraculous. Every year, a new leap forward. And this is going to be a big year for you. By the end of this year, many things are being lined up for you. And I just heard the Lord say, God's canceling every contract you ever signed that wasn't in alignment with him. God's tearing up things, covenants, covenants with death, covenants with the enemy. And you're in a new, a new place, a better place. As a sign from God, there's a miracle healing coming into your body. God's touching you. You're going to be a miracle man from your head to your feet. So God, thank you for your love and care for this beautiful family. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. There's someone here, rem remarkably and sadly, there's been in you or th that you know of three suicides in your family. And so that spirit just kind of just has ravaged people. And I have so much empathy, so much compassion, because I know what it's like to face that monster. And if that's you, just wave your hand at me so I can pray with you. <clears throat> that you know of, there's been, okay, okay, thank you. Lord, would you spread your love toward this uh, family? Father, we declare over our sister tonight that the curse of suicide is broken. Amen. And we declare no more. Everybody say no more. We plead the blood of Jesus over her and all of her blood relatives or legal relatives. And God, I thank you that all kinds of addictive powers are being broken. It's not just suicide. It's addictive spirits, addictive bondages. I break the curse of addiction. I break the curse of self-destruction. I, I declare miracles come to you, sister, and that no more of this lie no more of this sabotaging destructive oppressive horrific assault against you in the name of jesus christ so god's proud of you i want to say this to you sister god's proud of you he's proud of you for not blaming him for what happened he's proud of you for not libeling god because of what the enemy had done but i just want to say this it's miracle time for you there's a settlement coming, a, a financial or legal settlement coming to you personally that's going to change your finances. God's removing debt. And he's giving you a breakthrough at a realm of life that's significant and consequential. There's a beautiful young woman that's not here that's being touched by God tonight. All kinds of miracles are, are happening in your world in the orbit of your life and story. So God, thank you for your hand, your love, your care. I declare every person blessed, every man, everyone blessed, this family in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We, we praise you for your faithfulness. You're so good. And you care about it so powerfully. There's no one here tonight, God, that's hurting that you don't see and care for. I pray for my hurting friends tonight. Listen, if you've been battling intense. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenedchurch.com.